you know, we've been friends for years. Yes. And we might uh, end that friendship on this <laughs> yeah. podcast. Yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Charlie Sohn, a screenwriter and journalist. I'm Agnes Reese, a pop singer and songwriter. And this is Mysteries of the Euroverse, an American podcast about the Eurovision Song Contest. On today's episode, we're talking about Eurovision in America. First, we explore why the contest is suddenly catching fire on this side of the Atlantic. Then we talk to David Dobkin, director of the Eurovision movie, starring Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. Finally, we sit down with Tony Award-winning director Jerry Mitchell as he tells us what makes a top-notch production number in a game we're calling Tops and Bottoms with Jerry Mitchell. We take a look behind the scenes at all the scandal songs and queens. So come along as we traverse all the mysteries of the Euroverse. And we're here, uh, our very first episode of Mysteries of the Euroverse. Um, how does it feel, Magnus? It feels good. We are uh, very excited to be here to be podcasting, which is actually, I have to say, a phrase that I never thought I would say. And it's not because there's anything wrong with being a podcaster. I think no, it's just... as long as they don't rub it in our face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I think the thing for us is just it. It wasn't something that like we really saw for ourselves until we realized this topic, it meant that we had to become podcasters. Yes, 100%. Uh, we had run out of all other options. Our friends have stopped talking to us. So thank you, listeners, for being our outlet. Yes. Um, but I think it actually will be a mutually beneficial relationship. Because Eurovision, even though it's been big in Europe internationally, um, we're talking hundreds of millions of viewers, it really took until recently for Americans to start paying attention at all. Yeah. And what that means is, while there are plenty of sources out there uh, about Eurovision, they're all aimed at Europeans who grew up with the festival. And as we've spoken to Americans, I think many people think they know nothing about it, but you know, it, maybe they're fans of ABBA right. or Celine Dion. Both of whom came out of uh, the Eurovision Song Contest. And both of them won the competition. Yes. You know, as an American who came to this, this sort of new, what I was not aware of were things like the bribery scandals, the fascist dictators who tried to manipulate the results, the censored gay kisses, the international incidents. And actually, you know, I uh, this is my favorite, one contestant's daring escape from a genocidal war zone to make it to the Eurovision Song Contest. And actually, Magnus, do you know who that contestant was? It's, it's Celine Dion, right? A hundred percent. Okay, <laughs> great. So, so I think... I think hearing that setup, I think many people might go, why are we the ones to sort of tell this story? Right. And the answer is because we're just that fucking charming. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I do think that we bring something to the table as far as this kind of podcast. I mean, Magnus, you are an artist. Um, you've worked with Eurovision songwriters. And beyond that, you grew up with the competition. Yep. You grew up in Norway. And um, in fact, you were the one who introduced me to Eurovision. I remember going over to your place that first time and just being completely blown away. I'm, like I felt, I literally watching it felt like I was on mushrooms. Um, and that was only partially because I was on mushrooms while I was watching it. <laughs> yes. um, it really helped to have you there as a guide. And mm -hmm. through talking to you about it, I began to realize that there are all these things that you don't see when you come to the competition fresh. There are things about the rules that are fascinating. There are things about the political history that are fascinating. You ended up writing an article about your vision for Politico. Right. And what could be very cool about this podcast is that like that we're going to go at it uh, from two different perspectives, right? Yeah. Like you familiar with the festival, having gr grown up with it. And I, you know, came to it very recently. So the way uh, we see each episode is it's kind of in a three split. Well, the first segment is kind of history, context, and us delving into the theme. Yes. Then we take that theme into an interview with a Eurovision artist. And then the other interview is where we bring in someone uh, from American media or pop culture, uh, who's also related to the theme in some way. And often it involves us introducing them to Eurovision. So to now move into this episode, um, the theme of this episode is Eurovision in America. 
Mm-hmm. Eurovision has been around since 1956. 1956 was the aftermath of World War II, right? Europe was still trying to stitch itself back together. And they had created all these institutions um, to help that process, right? Like the UN was about, here's a place where we can discuss politics together, right? Like the um, EC, which later, you know, uh, grew into the EU, was like an economic agreement. And then, you know, there was, as there is in every family, the little queer cousin, Eurovision, uh, dressed <laughs> favorite, in sparkles. The, the favorite f- oh, family member. At least mom's favorite. <laughs> Um, Eurovision really was the sort of soft power component, right? And what was America's relationship like to it? So I think, you know, many people in the U.S. might not have heard the name, but indirectly they were familiar with the competition because they had heard a lot of songs that came out of the competition. You know, 28 songs from Eurovision have charted on the the Billboard Hot 100, which is the the American... um, a billboard chart, but 19 out of those 28 songs were before ABBA's Waterloo in 1974. And so something changed, right? And I think an important thing to uh, look at in this is that these songs that were charting were covers. Right. So you have songs like, you know, Volare, Love is Blue, Save Your Kisses for Me, Aldi Law, all songs that people might have heard, but they were covers. Right. So it's like Americans heard Dean Martin sing these songs. But then you think when things changed, right? 1974. That was the era uh, where we were moving away from a world of covers. Um, You know, I think we were interested in a certain amount of authenticity from our artists. Mm -hmm. We wanted them to be singing songs that we thought were somehow specially connected to them. And, you know, so covers just sort of stopped being a thing. And Eurovision lost its pipeline to the U.S. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's to the point where after 1976, there was 20 years where there was no Eurovision song that charted in the U.S. But there was one artist who finally broke this dry spell. And, you know, it was the depth of the lyrics. It was the craft of the songwriting. And it was just the iconic chorus that did it. Her song is the longest charting song in Eurovision history. Um, In fact, you could say it charted a little on the charts, and then it charted a little bit more. Maybe even, ooh, ah, just a little bit more. Yes, that's right. It was Gina G, (laughs) um, whose song, ooh, ah, just a little bit, um, finally broke through in the U.S. market. But but it was kind of became an anomaly. You know, it immediately led into another dry spell. Yes. But the dry spell that was broken in 2021 really changed things. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's been many songs charting since then. Duncan Lawrence charts with Arcade in 2021. Then the next year, Rosalind Snap charts in the US. And then you have Monoskin, who's become a huge band in Europe internationally, but also specifically in America. Right. So we had, after all of this dry spell, we had three Eurovision acts charting. In um, in the span of like two years. In the span of two years. And not only that, like this year, Monoskin, same band, you know, they won uh, a US uh, MTV VMA award, the Video Music Award. Yeah. And I think the only other Eurovision artist that I could find who had won an American MTV VMA was Celine Dion. And I think, you know, this, this story of America waking up to Eurovision uh, started, I think, in 2016, really, um, when Logo began broadcasting uh, the contest in America, because it was not being broadcast in America. Correct. And, you know, Logo really, I think, did a great job of sort of functioning the way they did for the gay community, which is sort of providing a home to this community. And then, you know, letting that community go on and watch real television once they became more popular. Right. And given the number of things that uh, queer people have gentrified, it's amazing that we haven't been able to gentrify Logo. <laughs> still, uh, the production value is just not there. So alongside uh, Logo broadcasting it for the first time, um, Justin Timberlake was the one who was performing the Interval Act. Next, Madonna performs the Interval Act in 2019. And finally, the Eurovision movie comes out. So this is the Will Ferrell movie. Um, And, you know, not only did that movie come out, it was number one on Netflix. Yeah, which... In um, America, specifically. And in 2021, NBC started broadcasting it on Peacock. And then um, in a 
unexpected turn of events. Um, Flo Rida represented San Marino, uh, while I will say insisting that he had no idea what Eurovision is. Flo Rida is also not from San Marino, in case yes. that's, you know, spoiler alert. <laughs> well, and this is kind of one of those, those interesting things about Eurovision, right? Where it's like, you are representing a particular country. Um, there are all uh, sorts of different rules that each country has about right. what would qualify you to represent them. And it's very often that people are representing countries that they are not from. Earlier, someone might have gone, I heard they say Celine Dion. Right. Obviously, I know who that is. But Eurovision, isn't she Canadian? Yeah. Well, she represented Switzerland. Yeah. And San Marino, I will say in particular, is the overstock.com of, of your... They, they tend to grab from other countries. So then finally, Duncan Lawrence's Arcade, uh, which was in the competition in 2019, uh, then breaks through on the charts in the US in 2021, which really, I think, points to there's something that happened... In 2020? After, yes. If anyone knows what that small event that happened in 2020 yeah. was. But I do think the combination of the Eurovision movie being released, then the pandemic, totally. I mean, you know, this idea of like watching this like warm-hearted Will Ferrell movie that's all about home and community and and also travel and everything like that, I think, I think it created a kind of hunger, right? There's not a lot of new stuff coming out. So you go, this is based on a real thing. I'm going to look up some YouTube videos. Right. And or I, think, I found this winning artist. Yes. You know, Duncan Lawrence is the only Eurovision winner who was the reigning champ for two years. Right. Because when we say the competition started in 1956, it has run annually every single year with the exception of 2020. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it was a song that had a chance to get its footing through the entire time the movie comes out. There's also the TikTok effect. Um, and I think that they're kind of like, two ways to think about how TikTok has really helped Eurovision songs come to America. One is the simple fact that you don't really have to watch a broadcast anymore to find these songs, right? Rosalind in particular did not even um, do particularly well at Eurovision, but her song went viral. And it's because the algorithms are getting better. And if there are enough initial viewers, like it's going to find its audience. Part of it is that we're in this time of short content. And I think you look at, you know, a broadcast that's four hours, which is, yeah. you know, three to four hours is what the Eurovision finale is. Yeah. And it's, it can be a hard sell. Yeah. Because it, it, we're in this weird time where people will watch something for four hours, but they want to watch 10 second clips for four hours. Yeah. yeah, yeah and we're yeah. also living in a time of binge viewing. So it's this thing of like, you have to sell me with five seconds. And keep selling and, me. And you but have I'll to stay sell with me you. with more five seconds. Yeah. And then eventually what I want is a binge. So it's, it's this really weird paradox. It's the anxiety and commitment phobia of not wanting to watch anything long, mm -hmm. but it's the depression of not being able to get out of bed. So you end up watching a bunch of short things. <laughs> yes. And TikTok is perfect for that. And not only is it perfect for that, they're also an official partner with Eurovision. Right. And if you talk to any of the members of the EBU staff, particularly those uh, 60 and above, they are so excited about TikTok. They love telling you about TikTok and the kids and how the kids are watching Eurovision. Right. And and just to clarify, when Charlie says that, it's because they told this directly to Charlie. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, I, but, but I do think, I think the other aspect of TikTok is um, that it's a visual medium, right? Totally. You know, Eurovision songs have different needs than songs on the radio. Writing a song that can support visuals takes a different kind of songwriting. And so you have Rosalind's Snap, right? Where it's like, literally, the chorus is a physical action, right? right. And on the radio, that doesn't really matter. Right. Now, Eurovision songwriters tend to write visually because it's going to have to support staging. And calling a song Snap also makes it perfect for TikTok and what songwriters who want to go viral on TikTok often do, right? They go, right. What's, a, what's, a, what's a dance move that I can put in the title of this song that then people will do and it'll go it becomes viral? becomes a challenge. Yes, exactly. Um, you look at the success of Snap and I really do think it it reflects this idea that that Whereas Eurovision has always had a visual element, has always needed music that supports visuals. Now kind of the rest of culture is caught up to that. Right. And then, then there's what I think we refer to as the Despacito effect. Yes. It's, it's this idea that um, American culture has gotten much more open to things that aren't just at its core so 
hamburger American, you know? (laughs) Oh my God. I am totally a hamburger American, I have to say. So, you know, we see like it took way too long in popular music in the US for Latin music to really you know, get the respect in the mainstream that it deserved. You know, people were saying, oh, if the song's in Spanish, it's never going to be mainstream. Now suddenly we're in a time where best picture could be a movie, not in English. Right. And then finally is the Ukraine effect. The the sort of parallel of Putin's invasion with Ukrainian success in the in the song competition, winning with College Orchestra. I mean, it just, I think, brought another side of Eurovision to Americans. The thing they were most likely to know is like, oh, there are a bunch of novelty, campy, silly European songs. And then suddenly you have this story of this song that has kind of become an anthem for Ukrainian resistance. I think really the answer is all of the above. Yeah. It's the fact that the pandemic, the Ukraine effect, the the rise of TikTok. Yeah, and I think we're going to see this sort of love for Eurovision in America only increase, uh, you know, I would say tenfold in the coming years because now there's a podcast. <laughs> Way to center yourself in the storyline there, Charlie. Oh my God, that's <laughs> what I like to do. Well, uh, I think it's time we take the focus off you, Charlie. Actually, off the both of us. Uh, and I think we should get to our guests. That sounds like a great idea. Um, So first, we're going to hear from David Dopkin, who has directed numerous hit movies, including Wedding Crashers, but also the Will Ferrell vehicle Eurovision Song Contest Fire Saga. So David, thank you so much for joining us. You know, to start off with, can you just talk a bit about uh, what your impression was when you first got the script? Um, I read the script. I loved it. I did not realize Eurovision was a real thing yet. And then I called in and said, look, I think it's really great. We should just come up with a different title. This is a terrible title, Eurovision. (laughs) And they were like, well, legally, we can't really change the title name because that's the name of the real contest. And it was like discovering the dark web. You're like, oh, my God, (laughs) a world of people and fanaticism and excitement. and, um, And it took me a little bit to get my head around what it was. But what blew me away was this idea that, you know, after World War II, there was a need for people to feel connected and for the European continent to feel involved in something together that wasn't going to carry any of the shame or the pain of what had just happened. You know, getting the tone around your head as an American is is crazy. I mean, it literally it took me months to understand, like, oh, this is funny but funny good. This is funny bad in a good way. They are just like, it's more like it's Coachella and somebody gets to win Coachella. You know what I mean? Like everybody's (laughs) psyched that they get to go play Coachella. You know what I mean? Like, so I got into it. I started to understand it. Um, Two things really occurred to me immediately. Number one, from a production standpoint, I was a little bit shocked because I was like, in America, we don't have 20,000 people at a live concert that is also a television show competition like those two things combining is very weird so all of a sudden i started to panic a little bit and i realized very quickly and i went to netflix and i said we need to go shoot the real eurovision in tel aviv in like four weeks because we can't recreate this there's just we don't have the money to do this that was number one the second thing that really occurred to me and was very funny was that the music still had to be great. I don't want to make a parody of something that people love. So I went to Max Martin and Savan Koteka, these Swedish Svengali guru songwriters, to who knew Eurovision and grew up with Eurovision. How did you navigate uh, the concern that it might become too insular? Because it does such a great job of like fan service to um, the to the Eurovision fan base, but also is obviously such just a a big warm movie that that yeah. anybody can come to and connect to. So, did you w- was that like a, a process, or were you just like we can reference what we can, but like let's keep the characters? No, it, and that's- it's a, it was a process of like what does Americans need to know, what do they not need to know? Um, here, look, the, one of the gifts, by the way, that I got when going to make the movie was that Netflix wanted to make the movie for the European market. But they were really like, oh, this is, we have 200 million people that watch this event in Europe. You know, 
they only had at that time 140 million people worldwide. So there was a huge audience to capture, and this was a possible draw. There's so many singing competitions that Americans just adapted. I mean, we never, there was zero confusion on the first preview in America. No, I mean, the movie tested much higher in America than it did in London even, you know. What was the process of securing the cameos in the movie? It took a while. People were really thinking it was going to be a joke. They didn't understand. I mean, it was a campaign. I had to individually like call managers. And, you know, management always makes things 10 times more complicated than the artist does, you know. I mean, they they were like, you know, uh, Conchita's not singing with another person and they want their own verse and, you know, Netta wants a scene in the movie as well. But once we got the first couple on, then it started to snowball. It was amazing because there were things that were not ironed out yet. Like Conchita singing with Elena was not, you know, there. I was told no. But once I got there, they were talking in the parking lot. I was oh, like, oh my amazing. God, you guys, like, you know, I said, I'm going to walk you through it, but, you know, I always wanted to hear your voices together and da-da-da. And they were like, oh, of course, of course. In a way, like what you describe is almost like they brought the Eurovision culture to the filming of the movie because that is very much backstage for these artists. They're competing on stage, but they're all like very friendly with each other. Our premiere for the movie was supposed to be, you know, at the next Eurovision. It was going to be the Saturday night finals and then Sunday night was going to be our premiere and we were going to bring the people who won and all of the people from the Eurovision thing, you know, Lars and Secret, Scooter Braun was going to sign them to management. They were going to be signed to um, a record label for real. So we were going to treat the entire release as if they were real guests and they were going to go on all the talk shows as the musical guests, as Lars oh and Secret, gosh. and then sit down and do interviews as them. And I, and I just want to follow up on one of the cameos, because obviously um, one of them was Loreen, who won this year. And it was so crazy for me. And by the way, I adore her. And she's just, as a person, a powerhouse. You know, that's somebody you walk in. By the way, when she came in the room, it's interesting. Like, some people command a certain reverence. They revere her. Her performance from the year she won the first time was like a classic. She was, you know fire she was so passionate and for her to come back and win again i was like this is impossible and by the way of course now i understand how nerdy that is something very striking about the movie i think is how much music is in it and how much music is actually doing the work of storytelling in it um so so how how did you navigate that you know i i was a commercial and music video director at ridley scott's company for since 96 so and I remember he produced my first movie and he said something to me once where I had a, um, in a rough cut, I had a song in that wasn't a great song yet, but it was just a placeholder. He's like, there's very few things as a filmmaker that you have control over at the end of the day. Great music, you have, you have the choice. Half of what they're experiencing is the emotional impact of the immediacy that music brings so when i went into this thing it was interesting we had a bunch of people demo songs for it and a lot of people came back with parody songs they were kind of jokes you know you hit my itch or like whatever you know and uh they were funny but they were i realized they weren't going to stand up to the storytelling requirements of what the show is and because will's so silly you kind of want the music to be really good. And you know, the first thing that Savin played for us was Double Trouble. And I was like, oh, I love it. I love it. He was like, well, if you hadn't, we were, we're writing some music for Ariana right now. We were going to change it into an Ariana song. I'm like, no, 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 I want it. But like, you could tell they were writing to write music. You know what I mean? They weren't trying to write a Eurovision song. At the end of the movie, we come to Husevik, which was a song. It was very funny because at the time, I had scouted all these places in a Iceland to figure out where to set it. And I had my heart set on Husavik, but it was production was like, we're not sending you there. It's too expensive. It's too far away. <laughs> I'm like, well, I already started writing the song and I'm using the word Husavik in the title. And they're like, well, then change it to Grenjavik. I'm like, it's not going to be Grenjavik. It's going to be Husavik. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was a song that had to emotionally capture what she was about. It had to address their relationship. 
it's something that only a musical movie can do is give you somebody singing a song to another person. I wrote it for you. Like that's what movie musical moments for me. I my whole life I've dreamed of having a moment like that in a movie. And so it was we worked on that song a lot. There are 17 drafts of like some of these songs were honestly double trouble never changed. There's a production pass and that was it. And I'm glad that you said that about how the music works. And I hate to bitch about this. In the Oscars and in awards competitions, it's supposed to be how the music is used to pro pro propel the story forward. Not it's on the end credits and we all love the song. Okay. And that's what four of the other five were. By the way, that whole piece of music that's during the voting section at the end, which is Cigaros. Yeah. Um, that was a temp piece that nobody could beat. And every and my music people were like, you're not using the whole piece. Are you using the whole piece? Like it's a six minute. <laughs> so the band heard it. And one of the guys was like, can I clean it up for you? And he glued it in there, man. I don't know what he did. It's magic, you know, like, so even that to me is, and by the way, my composers from Iceland, you yeah. know, in the very beginning, five minutes into the movie, he said, can I run to the bathroom for a second? He left. And I'm like, okay, that was weird. He came back and he was like, I got very emotional. He goes, how do you know about the ham and the beer? And I'm like, what are you, in 1974? And I'm like, I was told that by when I was scouting Iceland. Well, somebody told me that there was an embargo. You couldn't get ham or beer. He's like, oh, yeah, there was a huge embargo. He goes, but during Eurovision in Husavik, those fishermen would bring in the ham and the beer. And for Eurovision, like we would all break the rules for this one competition. And he's like, it's so emotional that you took the time to get it right. Right. Well, I think totally. It's like Iceland didn't feel like they were made fun of. Eurovision fans didn't feel like they were made fun of. I'm curious about some of those choices because it's, uh, you know, whether it obviously the hamster wheel is, is, a, is a real thing from Eurovision. But, uh, but like even the staging of these numbers, that's really where you get to really dig in with the fun that is Eurovision. You know, comedy to me, is the overcommitment to the absurd. That's what Eurovision does so brilliantly. Like, those people are never winking. They don't. Which is why also, why got, you know, they were like, oh, your bad guy is gay and he's going to have a pronoun joke. My gay friends were all, I played it for them. They were like, dude, this is fine. I'm telling you it's fine. No one's going to be upset. We're going to run it in the preview. I'm not pulling it. And if somebody has a complaint, we will then deal with it because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Like, obviously, these comics are all being so defensive about what they can say, what they can't say. It's like, you can make a trans joke without hurting trans feelings. That's fucking bullshit. You're just lazy. You just want to be able to do it the way you fucking always did it, Dave Chappelle. And I get it. Um, <laughs> I love Dave Chappelle. But when you're not representing people fully, then you don't, then you have a problem. The truth for me that I loved about Lemtov is he's yeah he's the bad guy because he's the antagonist because he's going to break him up he's right about everything he tells her he's ignoring you you have a great voice you should be somebody else you should right. he's he's actually the voice of reason he's a good guy I mean casting Dan Stevens in that character um, I feel like was such an interesting move right I said you remember the guy that was like the gorgeous guy that died in Downton Abbey. He's like, oh yeah. I'm like, I think he'd be funny as Lemtov. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, let's I think as an actor, he was wary of like where this guy sat. You know, it's based on a real Russian performer. I mean, in Russia, you know, there's no gay people in Russia. So he yes. has this whole thing that they, they based it on this guy that is this crazy flamboyant dude who like has pictures with, you know, Putin. And he's like, looked at as this big pop star. And you're like, he, and he's super gay and super really awesome. Will was like, I just think the most manly man in the world is my dad, and he's ashamed of me. And I, was like, yeah. I was like, that's just terrible. And he's like, he's like, I think it's Pierce Brosnan, like the best looking man in the world. Like, and I was like, okay, let's go get him. I'm like, he's only 15 years older than you, but we'll figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have to say that that there's something about that plot line that part of this like tonal balance that that you really struck. Um, particularly, I mean, you know, people talk about the, the, the sort of like opening Lars's, um, uh, mother has just died. Right. And, uh, and, and him 
seeing the ABBA performance, finding a sense of home that he had lost in in this competition. But then also immediately Pierce Brosnan <laughs> off to the side. Uh, it's just like Eurovision. I'd rather kill myself or something like that. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's such a strange scene to open on. And at the same time, it sets up everything. I, I, you know, it's interesting. I tried to adjust it. I tried to change it. I tried. I was like, what else do I need to see here? And it was just so efficient and so kind of silly in a way, but also kind of like you got it. And Pierce, you know, it's funny. He's such a nice guy. He just did not want to be mean to the kid or mean to Will. We needed them to be broken, you know, and there's like this, this question of like Lars and his stunted growth and his, you know, how is he going to ever change? And by the way, he's never going to be change unless he has his father's approval and he's also not going to have his father's approval unless he takes a risk so those things are just all built in there um and it's the three of them in that room and it ends up being the three of them at the end and uh it's a very efficient story in that way i really um that relationship you know and having his lost his mother and then having a, a parent that doesn't understand you um is very very complicated and to have to pursue a dream in the face of someone telling you that you're wasting your time. And what I realized in this movie, when I first got that 89 page draft and I sat down with Will, I was like, you know, well, it's really their relationship. Like what the movie's really about the two of them. And he goes, well, maybe she's writing music and he doesn't know it. And I'm like, there you go. Rachel's my secret weapon in the movie. Before we cast her, I said to Will, I'm like, you can put her opposite anyone and you will believe the love story. And um, the minute you see the two of them together, you're like, oh, I get it. And I and she was able to find someone who was innocent enough, sweet enough, simple enough, make you believe it enough. I mean, look, this is ridiculous. That they've been together for like 20 years and they've never touched each other. You know, like what she does at the elf house. I mean, by the way, talk about another two minutes of exposition that sets up like a whole fucking story. I mean, it's kind of, they're terrible cheats. You don't want to do that in a movie if you don't have to. But if you have someone like that and all of a sudden you're like, okay, she's going to load it up. She's magic. Speaking of Rachel McAdams, I want to go back to that, that Husevic moment at the end, because there's something, you know, just in the context of this Eurovision podcast is that like this idea of like representing your country or representing home or at that sits alongside this like this real sense of broader community right like and and there's something in that moment where like both ideas are encapsulated right like it's like yes this song yes. That, she want, that that represents her hometown and yet like so much of what that ending is it is about finding like uh, finding a broader home or, or, or a broader sense of community so can you talk about like kind of how you navigated that i remember being like Will, I think the whole third act, you should be in it. I think you should get on that stage in your yellow thing. And he's like, okay. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> I'm like, dude, we're like, we're kind of beyond that. You know what I mean? It, it's your vision. But the fact that it all came together like that, and it feels like a Eurovision song, we didn't cheat at the end, right? And um, And that it's about my hometown it's about like we're here on this stage but what i really love is being back there with you by the way it's the most romantic thing you could think of it's totally. so anti-patriarchy the woman is singing to you to give up on your fucking shit and i also think it it's so amplified especially in regards to what your vision is and represents um i, re I remember we showed someone a video and they were going, they're, they're waving the wrong flag. Did they like run out of money or something? And I was like, no, that's your vision. People root for everyone. And, and, and I think it's so beautiful. They both tells this story of home from a perspective that an American who doesn't know the competition can understand. I love what you just said. I just, you know, here's the thing. I don't think we get home as Americans. I think we're actually very fucking conflicted about it. We left home everyone who is here walked away from something or we went through the trauma of someone in our family having to or wanting to something but we all walked away from home europe is still there i i think that that what's so special about eurovision is it is about home it is about your country it's not in a we're better space but it's in a 
look how sophisticated what we're talking about is. <laughs> you know, like, but that's what something that the movie gave me the opportunity to do as a director. There's these reasons we come together and we gather for these things. And out of the wreckage of World War II, which was so fucked up, the fact that they invited Germany, the fact that they invited Italy, yeah, right. everybody was allowed to come and be clean again and start over. That's a your dude, Americans aren't that smart. <laughs> <laughs> there is, smart. There is we don't get this yet. We're in the adolescence right now. That's why we're dealing with authoritarian insanity. Right. They've been through it, but they're on alert in Germany. They know how to teach about the Holocaust. We can't teach about slavery. We're trying to hide it, dude. Are you kidding? This is fucked up. Actually, like one of the early German entries, I think, into Eurovision was actually just a, as a song about needing to face the aftermath of the Nazi regime. 15 years after, after the end of World War II, uh, when that number was like broadcast on television and you're just like compared to like here where like 200 years like you know we 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 can't come to terms with any of that and it's so funny today like it's like all these conversations about twitter and stuff like that and it's like oh well we're losing our public square and like blah blah blah, blah. and yet here like there's actually one where it doesn't devolve into people you know having like food fights on the internet and it's like kind That's of amazing. exactly right yeah and by the way they do talk about politics and they talk yeah. about ridiculous shit. It just goes to show you how insular our worlds are that I didn't know anything about this three years ago. And, you know, when Will was like, you know, this is bigger than the Super Bowl. I was like, what are you, ta <laughs> what are you talking about? That's the line about? I always use. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And then you look at the numbers and you're like, oh, this is crazy. But is, is there a world where a sequel uh, is something we might see? <laughs> We've talked about it. I hope so. We'll see. Netflix is... Uh, they, they, they're incredibly cagey. Too bad because, you know, Netflix had Eurovision broadcast rights for the two years after the movie as well. So right. like, if we had had that premiere in the role in, I think we could have had a different thing in America with Eurovision. Well, I mean, just sort of off of that, talking about the um, the Oscar performance. Um, oh, and that was beautiful. We really put that together with um, Molly singing and getting her to Husavik. And by the way, this town of Husavik put it together. If you go to Iceland, every school in Iceland sings this song now. It's really? amazing. And when you go to Husavik, the quotes are painted around the town. And the first Eurovision Museum in the world has opened up in Husavik. It's just, a, it's a wonderful, amazing, weird thing that's happened. It's also, I, Iceland was such the perfect choice, but I don't think there's any country that has a higher percentage of people watching Eurovision. I think, I think like, you know, uh, if no broadcaster in the US would ever talk about having over like 90% of <laughs> right, the population yeah, yeah. watching. I know that, yeah, yeah, watch The something, country yeah. stops for, uh, literally for Eurovi uh, Eurovision. Well, and also there's that thing where it's like, I, cause Iceland has never, has never won. Right. But, but, but the year the movie came out, you know the the oh, expectation they was would have won 100 percent yeah Cody, whatever that guy's name was yeah daddy daddy fryer right yeah yeah daddy yeah he got, daddy fryer. He got, he got ripped off yeah. by the way the funniest thing was when he started re-recording the songs from husavik dude, i was gonna ask, i was gonna ask he started you, to like, re-record them yeah yeah ding dong cover because, yeah <laughs> I love I love that it kind of played out what happened in the movie because I think he said he was like all of you have been asking me to do Yaya Ding Dong fine okay fine I'll do it <laughs> yeah, yeah thank you so thank much you for so taking much. the time anyway, what a what a lovely you guys are really smart you know the movie really well yeah. yeah I mean it's 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 really remarkable how how you guys really hit the bulls high on that so uh, thank you so much for for taking the time. You. Next up is Jerry Mitchell, the director-choreographer of Broadway's Kinky Boots and Legally Blonde. Okay, we are here with a two-time Tony-winning director-choreographer known for getting Broadway whipped into shape, Jerry Mitchell. Hi, um, thank you for having me. And yes, two-time Tony Award winning, but a three-time Tony Award recipient. Wait, say more. Well, this year I received the prestigious Isabel Stevenson Tony Award for Broadway Bears. The Isabel Stevenson Award is actually more important to me than any of the others, just because it represents 31 years of like, um, you know, doing something for the people I lost. For those of you who don't know, Broadway Bears is, is a major, major burlesque show. It should be in Eurovision. 
I mean, I mean uh, it vibes very Eurovision, it, it actually. Totally. It's a naked Eurovision. <laughs> okay, so we wanted to have Jerry on the show uh, because throughout his career, he's proven that he knows how to make a number work. Uh, and we're hoping that he can give us a little insight into what separates a winning Eurovision number uh, from one that ends up with the dreaded NQ. NQ. Non-qualifier. Oh, so these are original songs. These are original songs. Yes. So never been heard. Yeah. So officially. So you're really talking about doing a production number in a Broadway show. To, yeah. Totally. Basically. Totally. You and got the sets, thing you got is, costumes, you got a star, and you got a new song that nobody knows. That the audience exactly. is Good luck, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and also uh, for the for the the grand final. Uh, why don't I enter the Eurovision contest with my song from one of my musicals? Well, I, do you get a recording career or something? <laughs> I mean, I will say Abba and Celine Dion won the competition, so you know what. Yeah, correct. The only reason we know ABBA before in the US, before so yeah. long, ABBA long, won okay, in the. I don't know anything about your vision <laughs> song contest. So, How long has it been um, going on for? So um, what? You know, 19, the, it's since 1956. Every Jesus, year, with that's the before exception I was born, and I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Charlie, do you know the four criteria Eurovision judges use to evaluate numbers? Creativity, uniqueness, nerve, and talent. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's pretty close. Eurovision judges are actually looking at the vocal capacity of the artists, performance on stage, composition and originality of the song, and overall impression of the act. So I think what's worth adding is that you can max have six people on stage for each number. Oh. And and I do think there's something interesting. Now Jerry's not interested. Only <laughs> six people. So well, we're it's talking like Kimberly Kimbo Eurovision. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Janine Tesori has got a great number for next year. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, then, then I think that means we can start start our game, uh, which we are calling "Tops and Bottoms" with Jerry Mitchell. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that was the song from Broadway Bears Twenty Five. <laughs> Wait, really? It was That's called incredible. "Top Bottoms of the Burlesque." Oh my god! Wait, Top, we had sassy bottoms. <laughs> we had bossy bottoms. We had a whole oh bottom sequence, like the four seasons of bottoms. <laughs> Andrew Lippa wrote it. It was incredible. It I mean, would definitely win Eurovision. <laughs> but we, actually, oh, we we we, yeah, we had like we had 110 performers in that number. So I don't know. We make it. <laughs> yeah, you you couldn't get it down to we six. Could, no, no mm. way. No, we All need right. more bottoms than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Charlie, what are the rules of the game? Okay, so the rules of tops and bottoms with Charlie Mitchell, at least this version of tops and bottoms <laughs> with Charlie Mitchell, <laughs> um, is we are going to show you a live Eurovision performance, um, and you are going to react to it, and then you're going to tell us whether the song placed in the top half of the countries in the finals, or whether it was towards the bottom. Or didn't even qualify. Top or bottom. Yeah, yeah. top or bottom. Top We're or bottom. keeping it. No sides in this game. 50-50. Yeah, no yeah. sides in this game. <laughs> so, Jerry, what do you know about Eurovision going into this? I I watched during the pandemic the movie that was made with uh, yeah. about Eurovision. Yeah, the Will Ferrell and yeah. uh, Rachel McAdams. And Rachel McAdams. No, she's brilliant. She's amazing. I love that one. And, and, um, and you know, like, uh, and how Will Ferrell kind of found that project in a way is very similar to what this podcast is all about. Because Will Ferrell married a Swede. And that's how he was introduced to Eurovision. Really? And, and, and I found my Scandinavian. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, I think that when, you, when, the, when one is introduced to Eurovision, you can't help but love it. So with that, we can move to uh, Karia, who is from Finland. His number, Cha Cha Cha, from 2023. That's this year. Ooh, Karia Green. He just kicked through some wood. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a bottom. This is definitely a top coming out. <laughs> oh, there's pink people. Yes. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> He's holding the strings. Mm -hmm. He's a puppeteer. <laughs> cha, 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 cha. They're not doing the cha, cha, though. Uh, I think I'm going to, I think it's, I'm going to stop it. Okay, you're you're not you are not feeling this. I'm putting them in the bottom. Even though I think there are a lot of wonderful sort of Elements. things. I'm going to go, this is, this is style over substance. So interesting because this was actually the number one song with the voters. Mm. But uh, so I should explain the fact that the way Eurovision works today is that it's half jury votes and half uh, televotes. Yeah. So the industry um, professionals were not a fan. It's quite well presented. 
Yes. You know, this video and the film work and him coming out of the box and them coming out of the box. Very well directed. The color the green and pink. Yeah. There were great elements, but you you shouldn't know where the choreographer does stops working and the director starts working or the costume person stops working. Who came up with the idea shouldn't... There could be 12 people working on this number, but they all have to be thinking like one. Okay, <laughs> what's next? Okay, yes. So this I'm one is, for one. So the next up is Constructus in Corporo Sano from Serbia. 2022. Bangs. She's got bangs. She's got bangs. I think Hal Prince did this musical. It was Rosa. <laughs> to be healthy. To be healthy. To be healthy. To be healthy. I'm just going to let this play. I feel this like is this so is the new version of Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> <laughs> is Eurovision supposed to be pop music or is it supposed to be like theatrical music or is it supposed it's not to be supposed like to be anything when it comes to style really oh i don't I, there's I, been I, rap there's been hard rock there's been abba i i <laughs> it felt yeah. like i was watching a theater piece yes that's exactly what i felt like i was watching yeah. so i don't know if your vision goes for a theater piece i thought it was very well done and very clean and very specific <laughs> I don't know what the hell she was saying, <laughs> but I didn't turn it off because I was compelled you to watch her. To this was a surprise Eurovision hit. Um, really? So it finished. Number- she she was magical. She yeah. she's absolutely incredible. If I do a production of Fiddler on the Roof, I'm going to have her play Golda. <gasps> oh <laughs> my god! I mean, Amazing. she's she's like she's like that. Like yeah. she's an actress. By starting the song talking about Meghan Markle's hair, it grabs it, you. It grabs you, but it also kind of helps you think it's going to be a kitschy song. Yes. Right? It's going to be jokey. It's going to be ridiculous. And by the end, you know, we're now talking about, like, body standards for female artists. Yeah. She makes you listen. Right. Totally. And That's and I the think, difference. And I That's think the difference. She really makes you listen. Yeah. The other the other one, just before that, the, the th- thing about that song is it was an aggressive song. <laughs> yes. Right? So they put aggression on an aggressive song. So in yes. my side of theater, it's putting a hat on a hat. Or sometimes you have to be more aggressive when the music is more still. She was very focused. It's a a phrase Tommy Toon used to say called laser communication. She had laser communication in that number. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, and, and I, and I think it's that kind of stillness and focus. I mean, you even commented when the guy started jumping up and down, it's like every minor decision then um, becomes something that's like very meaningful and very important right, to, yeah. to the build of the number. I mean, she's talked about it in terms of wanting to make a Maria Abramovich pop song. It's, it's why, and I, I said this to you, it's like, I actually think, and obviously with Jerry Mitchell directing, if America ever sends a song to Eurovision, I think the artist they send is Taylor Mac, because it's like- well. Taylor Max, brilliant. <laughs> I, genius, but and, also, and, and it's that kind of work to me. Right? But three that, minutes- I mean, you know, he could get 24 hours down to three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> yeah, Taylor. Three minutes. <laughs> yes. Here we go. So next is Danish artist Riley with 2023's Breaking My Heart. Oh, beautiful image. Riley. <laughs> I don't know Riley. Is Riley a big star in their country? So, so he actually became big on TikTok, mostly among K-pop fans in Korea, I believe. So during the pandemic, during right? the pandemic, yeah. I think Riley could open for Taylor Swift. Oh, totally. Oh, I, I could totally see that. see that. I mean, it's very young. Yes. Do young girls vote for Eurovision? I mean, they are very strongly going after a TikTok audience these days. Like, you talk to anybody who works well, they, for well, this. This is 2023. This yes. is, yeah. And, and also, like, they're one of their official partners is TikTok, which yes. is definitely- So I'm going to say Riley ended up in the top. So here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> he was dis- Riley was disqualified. He was an NQ. In qu- NQ. NQ. And this is, like, the most youthful heart stoppers- High School Musical, the Musical 3 performance, and you would think this person probably has a billion followers on TikTok. And he does. And is is definitely a star and could definitely open for Taylor Swift. Yeah. And yet Eurovision says no. 
So Jesus. Riley didn't need fucking Eurovision. No, no exactly. <laughs> but I think it, it does also speak to something about the rules of the competition yes. too, because I think that, you know, they require you, all, all lead vocals have to be live. They keep the vocals very dry and they do not allow the use of any tuning. It's, but it is interesting because you're, because you're, as a songwriter, sometimes you sit there and you listen to a track like um, Breaking My Heart and you're like, ah, oh, the vocal stacking is so cool. The falsetto stuff is so cool. I wish I could do that. And then you are reminded of why in a live context that but can we're be really doing tough. a lot more of that. No, yeah, musicals. But it's the it, Ableton has become a Broadway well, standard. Well, I mean, we, we had an Ableton time. system in Kinky Boots, right? So yeah. Sex is in the Heel, uh, Just Be, Raise You Up. Well, if if, if Those, Cindy Lauper is writing your yeah. songs, you want to give her yeah. the tools. She, that, well, she she Cindy and I go back to Hey Now, the remake which I choreographed for her hmm. with 50 drag queens. And she said, I, Jerry, Jerry, I want to give you songs that make you want to dance. And I went, oh, okay, yeah, I love that. And so it was brilliant what they were doing, brilliant stuff. So number four is Noah Kirell, uh, whose song Unicorn uh, was also this year. This is uh, Israel's entry this year. Israel, I'm going to watch you like a unicorn. <laughs> Power of a unicorn. Ooh, choreography's hot. Staging is great. You wanna see me dance? You wanna see me dance? Oh, who's she? She's oh. the star. She's the the but that's not her. Yeah, that's, that's her. Oh girl. <laughs> well, she dances maybe better than she sings. <laughs> oh, she's definitely a dancer who sings, not a singer who dances. <laughs> And I mean that in the best way because yeah, I yeah. love Bebe New Earth and a lot of other great. Sheena Rivera, you could say, is a dancer who sings. Oh my God. I think I'm torn between that yeah. one because the dancing was definitely top, but the singing was definitely bottom. <laughs> and the production sort of didn't start till halfway through because. <laughs> Because the other people weren't out there. Yes. So I'm going to say Eurovision put it in the bottom. It actually placed third overall. Mm. She is a top, which I think well, was... Well, she's, she's a fabulous dancer. Yeah. Oh, so great performer. A dancer who sings she, and a great performer. Right. She's yeah. going to play Zydel in, <laughs> yeah. in the same film. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She's, but I think it's, like, it's a little bit like the opposite to Riley's uh, number. Because um, the first time I heard this number, I, I was... I was not the biggest fan because that that unicorn metaphor is being hit a little hard. <laughs> I've got a unicorn in that bedroom. <laughs> you know, listen, I like, I, I like your unicorns. I love unicorns. I have a unicorn coffee cup. I work out at Mark Fisher Fitness, which is the unicorn. Hundred <laughs> percent. I'm, I'm familiar with them. I will say, I had the exact same feeling of Ma as Magnus when I heard the song. I was like, "This is trash," and then I saw her performance of it and. As a dancer, yeah, she she's sold. a dancer who sings. And but also, I feel like she also, she's a dancer who sings who really knows it. Because two-thirds through the number, she goes, do you want to see me dance? And then <laughs> yeah. she stops yes. singing. And she's Stop. done. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's great because then she doesn't have to come back and sing after she dances. You know, I know. That's yes. always <laughs> when you have to return to the vocal after the dance break. You, that's when you really separate the boys from the girls on the right. <laughs> Wendy Houston auditioned for Dream Girls for Broadway. No. And she um of course sang the shit out of the out of the audition. And on her card they wrote dance zero, <laughs> voice ten. And I get a call from Arlene Phillips and she says, Jerry, I need an assistant to work on this video for this young artist. And I walk in and I'm 26 and she's 23. And I end up working with Arlene and choreographing a great deal of it with Arlene, uh, the I Want to Dance with Somebody video for Whitney Houston. Oh my God. So, and she couldn't dance, but all I could get her to do was this. <laughs> You watch the video. This is what but she's listen, doing. Well, she didn't say go. I can dance. She says I want to dance. And she went, ah, <laughs> da, da. that's all I could get her to do. And I met I met her in Paris late at a later date, and we laughed so much about the video. And now she was a huge star. Now I oh have to gosh. say, every every time I hear I want to dance with somebody, and the the backup chorus of aggressive men who say dance comes dance. in, <laughs> I'm gonna just think that's you. Ooh. Yelling, yeah. yelling at Whitney Houston. Yeah. 
<laughs> so next, um, next is Anna Bergendal. This is my life, 2010, Sweden. It's Jane Krakowski. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people in Sweden look like Jerry Brickhouse. Now we gotta, now we gotta uh, drive in. Yeah? Took two minutes to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stop this. It's a kind of a bottom in for a lot of reasons. Oh, we want to hear every reason. <laughs> <laughs> but first, before, before you go into it, I want to uh, just say that you are 100% right. Um, this did not, this was an NQ. See, because when I saw her, I went, oh, it's Jane Krakowski. Yeah. But it's which, not. Which it's, is a good way to start a number. It's not Jane Krakowski. Yeah. Right. right. Because Jane Krakowski has a point of view. Right. And she makes you listen. And this girl was lovely, but Jane Krakowski, it's that thing. It's that it factor, right? It's, it's the. Uh, and then the, di- the guitar disappeared magically. So <laughs> I, I wasn't sure when they did the wide shot, suddenly it was gone. Somebody grabbed it and ran off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why this song, I, you know, I wanted to put it on the list because it's such a perfect example of a song that is totally fine, like good in a, in a context of I have it on a playlist. I'm going to listen to it. It's catchy. And then both because. Oh God, I'm trying to remember the phrase you used. Um, the the thing about the performer laser laser focus. yes, it's just none of that. It's yeah. it's a little bit it's a little bit blank, and so it feels emotionally inaccessible when you watch it. Let's see let's see if we find that that X factor in um, Sweden's 2022 entry. Uh, this is Cornelia Jacobs. Hold me closer, Barry. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, she's in pain. She's in pain. <laughs> she is. You should see her perform at the clubs at 2 a.m. She's in a lot of pain then, too. <laughs> if you're a vision, you better vote yeah. <laughs> yeah. I vote yes. <laughs> And you are 100% right. Yeah. Cornelia Jacobs is a top in the competition, yeah. in the bedroom. She... <laughs> <laughs> she All I, genders. All genders. All sexes. Listen, tops. Top, she's sexy. She's, she's like... so sexy, right? Boys, girls, theys, thems, everything in between. Who and doesn't want Cornelia? I mean, it's... Singing in their bedroom while uh, they're having sex. I mean, yes. I I I play it every time I do. She doesn't have. You want to see me dance? <laughs> you know, she just kind of like is singing a song. Does you want to see me mentally break and down? She looked right at you. She looked right at you. Yeah, I I I almost get uncomfortable watching this performance no, because but- it's so engaged and it's so sharp and it's so like being invited into somebody's inner world that I, I think it's really special yeah, no, what she does. And, and there's something yeah. about her voice, how she, and this is not exclusive to this performance. No. She I'm always sure sounds like she was up a little bit too late last night. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's the perfect it's, that's, amount. That's yeah. the smoke. And because the, she's been up all night. And the scotch. <laughs> all right, let's yeah. do Belgium. <laughs> yes. So this is Kate Ryan. Um, <laughs> and uh, my French is not good. Je t'adore. So, so Belgium 2006. Here we yeah. go. She's holding a microphone. Why are they doing glowing microphones on stands? Video screen steps. Why? <laughs> Band stands with lights. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I just I just want an entire podcast. Very... <laughs> Different topics just being like why? why? <laughs> okay. You know what this reminded me of? This reminds me of a, a number on the Tony Awards when you know the show's going to close. Oh my god. It's but a, I'm glad TV, I'm glad Kate Ryan TV, kept it open on TV, for the it's uh, like I love this. I love this. Yes. I love this. why did the show close? Which I have to say is the thing I find myself asking most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I ask myself because yeah. I've had many of my shows close. <laughs> why did my show close? <laughs> if only if only one day I hope to have a show that runs long enough that there is a closing that's a that's yeah. a surprise. <laughs> Did it win the contest? It no. was an it was an NQ. She's a beautiful woman, and that dress is gorgeous. And the wind machines, it's all it's got all the right elements. Yeah, but it doesn't have a focus. But this is why we come to Jerry Mitchell because <laughs> I watched this number and I was like, I can't believe this didn't qualify. The song's a bop. 
I, you know, I thought the microphone thing was kind of fun. We're so, gonna send you a new link now. Okay. And what so, was this Swedish? This is Loreen with the song Tattoo. Yo. <laughs> 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 Jerry Mitchell's cover is coming out uh, shortly after Devil Herbs Prada. She's sandwiched in. She ain't got no room. She can't even stand up. All right, Lorene, Lorene's the star. Yo! But it's your stuck on me like a tattoo. God. <laughs> so, well, look, the lyrics, you know. That makes a lot of sense for people today. but i you know i think it's one of those things where it's like again when i heard this song i was like this song is fine um and then i saw this performance with this like stunning strange you know swedish woman and i was like i might be obsessed with you it's It's a a star star performance so um after watching all of this yes Yes, I'm listening. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are Eurovision is a fantastic uh, uh, show with amazing artists trying to present three-minute musicals. I think that's, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> that's a perfect way to put it. Yeah. And if the tone is right and everyone's on the same page, you're going to win. And if everyone's on a different page, you're going to be in queue. <laughs> <laughs> I I really hope that this becomes a part of your new everyday lingo. Yeah. In queue. This <laughs> yeah. number. In queue. In queue. Say when I say brilliant. that they're doing a three-minute mini musical, yeah. they really are. Because, you know, Eurovision isn't about the song only, even though it's a song contest. It's about how you present that song. The costume. The lighting the camera work, but most importantly, who is the center of that whole thing? Mm. Who's the performer? And I think the thing that's amazing about Eurovision is you have these artists that a lot of them are huge stars in their own country. They might be the judges on their version of The Voice or whatever. And then they walk onto this international stage and they go, my face means nothing. My name means nothing. All I have is I can present who I am as an artist in three minutes and this song yeah. and the staging. And that's that's all you have. I will say, it's, my, it's, your face means nothing. Your name means nothing is actually what Jerry Mitchell tells every actor when they walk into his rehearsal. <laughs> no, no. It, it, Eurovision is really a modern day three minute opera. It's like opera in many countries, you're going to see an opera and you don't understand the language it's being presented in. But if the director and the creative team are so clear in the way they're telling the story, you walk away going, I felt that, right? Totally. I will say my favorite moment in La Traviata is when in the middle of an aria, she goes, do you want to see me dance? <laughs> <laughs> Eurovision in Sweden, directed, choreographed, produced by Jerry Mitchell. <laughs> yes, amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, yes, guys. This, this was, was incredible. <laughs> Charlie, I have to say, I was blown away by both of our guests this week. Yeah, totally. Smart, funny, and you know, in Jerry's case, great at making cocktails. I mean, I am still hungover. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, same girl. Next week is Queer Vision, where we talk about the queer history of Eurovision. We uh, have some very exciting guests for you. Um, Gustav, who, as Eurovision fans will know, represented Belgium this year uh, with Because of You. I mean, yes, he basically left his career as a performer because he couldn't be out. Yeah. And pushback he got. And then here he is on the world's biggest stage uh, with the queerest number you could imagine. Yeah. And we've also got Tony-nominated actor Robin DeJesus, who you may have seen in Netflix's Tick, Tick, Boom, Boys in the Band, or Hulu's Welcome to Chippendales. He's going to drop by and play a game called Gay or Eurovision. Anyway, that's next week. So, you know, come back and listen to us then. And until then, happy Eurovision. Eurovision.